evening and welcome to the Family Action Council of Tennessee Legislative Issues Briefing. I'm Todd Payne. I'm with Bot Radio Network here in Memphis. I know we have a lot of Bot Radio Network listeners, and if you're a regular Bot listener, you're familiar with David Fowler. David Fowler is one of us. He's family. Uh, I um, had, you probably know, he's often a guest on many of our interview programs. I know uh, he's been a guest with Pat McClurkin, who's here in the audience. Uh, also a guest with Karen McNeil, who's here in the audience. I think he's been a guest with Steve Copeland, who uh, is also here in the audience. And of course, Byron Tyler, who's right up front here taking pictures as always. And uh, so David is, is part, he's part of the Bot Radio family. Of course, he's also been on The Complete Story with Dick and Rich Bot on nationally. So he's been done that at least twice, I believe. I first became familiar with David about 20 years ago when he was a state senator from, from uh, Chattanooga. He had this newsletter via email and I, I got on it because I, I heard about this guy in Chattanooga who was just strong for the family and strong for biblical principles. And it's rare but amongst anyone in elected office, but also including even here in Tennessee. And that just really impressed me. And later on, when I went to work for Bot Radio, I got to meet him, got to know him really, really well. And so I'm really happy that he's here. David is a native of Chattanooga. He's a graduate of UT Chattanooga. He got his law degree at the University of Cincinnati. After that, he served as a clerk on the Ohio Court of Appeals. He later went into private practice, eventually moved back home to Chattanooga. In 1994, God called him to run for state senate against an incumbent who'd been there quite a while. And David won. David served three terms in the Tennessee State Senate. And finally, around 2006 or so, he decided, I guess, really, God called him into a different path. And uh, it was about that time that fo organizations like Focus on the Family were creating family policy councils across America. And so they partnered with David and the Family Action Council of Tennessee was created 2006, 14 years ago. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to welcome David Fowler. Give him a big Memphis welcome, y'all. You're, you're, you're very kind. You're well, very kind. thank you. Well, yeah. we're happy to have you. Tell us what FACT does. Tell us a little bit about what, about what you do. Well, we, uh, we cause trouble and stick our finger in the devil's eye. No, I'm, I'm just... Just kidding, but that, that would be a short <laughs> summary, I guess yeah, you could say. Right. But uh, we actually, our relationship with BOT goes back uh, to the very beginning. As Todd mentioned, we were formed in 06 because Focus on the Family was interested in supporting the marriage amendment that was then going to be on the ballot. And I was in the state Senate and uh, I, I left the Senate to, to form this organization. Mm -hmm. We had a big rally with Dr. Dobson and Gary Bauer and all kinds of people in the Nashville area. And that's where I met uh, Dick and Rich Bott. They came to Nashville to broadcast the event and promote it through the Bott Radio Network. So uh, I met your boss maybe before you did. And so our, our relationship with Bott goes a long way back. And thank you. This is our first time to do a, a legislative issues briefing that, that we've tried to work with another organization. And y'all have just been a beautiful partner. And of course, Bellevue Baptist has been great. And, and for those of you who go to church here, Gary, uh, Humble, our CEO, has been doing a lot of the work with Steve, and I got a little jealous. He said, well, I got to go over to Bellevue and meet with Steve. And I thought, wow, he gets to meet with Dr. Gaines, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, Steve. But Steve do, has done a great job uh, helping us get this pulled Steve together. Steve Cowart. Steve Cowart. <laughs> That's right. But uh, anyway, so, so what we do, if you don't know what we do, is we do a lot of educational things. This would be one of those educational things. And tonight we are live streaming uh, across the rest of the state so that those who are not here in the Memphis area can uh, can observe what we're doing. But then we lobby on the Hill, we draft bills. But the other thing that we started doing is we started getting involved in litigation because so many issues now are being decided in the court system that if you're not in the court system, you're not playing. It's like not showing up for the ball game. And so uh, God had given me a law degree that I hadn't used in a number of, of years to actually practice law, but I'm now uh, handling some lawsuits actually on behalf of some pastors who are suing over the marriage issue. We'll talk about it a little bit um, later today, but uh, I want to commend uh, two of the pastors are here tonight that I know of. Gary Starbuck is here and uh, Rich Savella is here tonight and they are two of the pastors who are saying 
if, if the state is going to define marriage contrary to God's law, then I will not help you carry out an ungodly, unbiblical marriage policy. Find somebody else to do it. And that takes great courage. A lot of people don't want to do that. So I want to acknowledge those two pastors and thank them. So that's a little bit about what we do. Every Friday I send out a commentary, uh, our five minutes for families. If you don't get it, we give some news snippets. And then also uh, I write a commentary on a subject. Tomorrow's commentary will actually be on the abortion issue. And is there any hope to ever think the United States Supreme Court would overturn Roe versus Wade? Um, so you might want to read tomorrow's commentary. You'll find it, F-A-C-T, Tennessee, F-A-C-Tennessee.com. Or. So you that's a, a little bit about what we do. Got a podcast as well, right? Yeah. We, oh, yeah. Uh, right. Gary Hummel and I do a podcast every Friday, and uh, called um, God, Law, and Liberty. And I would invite you to join it. And it's not a typical uh, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity show where we just get on and rag about people. Uh, we actually try to talk substantively about things. So uh, the hope is that you'll go away better informed and with a headache because. You've actually had to think rather than just be entertained by insults. So uh, I, I hope y'all will listen. You've actually been listening, which is I have uh, after bot radio goes <laughs> off the air in the middle of the night, right? That's when you listen. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. At the same time, I listen to the radio. You yeah, know, at the same time, you listen. Know. <laughs> so anyway, that's good. So uh, that's what we do. Yeah, absolutely. And we invite you to join us every Friday as we release a new podcast. Oh, great, David. Thank you. Well, you know, David, as we prepare for this evening. You shared some things that you had had said had transformed the way you think about the work of lobbying for and against various legislative proposals and even the, the educational work that FACT does. And we thought it would be good to put tonight's discussion of legislation, lobbying, and citizen, uh, citizen engagement in that context. But you said there was a statement made by the late R.C. Sproul that helped you focus or frame your thinking that led to the change in your thinking. Would you mind sharing that? Sure, sure. Yeah, we met in our office a few weeks ago and we we're just talking about what we wanted to cover. And as we, we talked about a few things, we thought, you know, this would be good to, to put in there because my perspective on what I do has been greatly changing over just really the last year, even though I've been in state politics as a legislator or a lobbyist for 20 something years. But I was reading an article uh, by a person who runs an organization that quoted something that R.C. Sproul had said, and it just sort of stuck with me. And, and the statement was, was this, uh, why is greater than what is greater than how? And as he explained it in the article, the point is, if you know why you're doing something, it makes life so much easier because then you know what it is you should do. And then once you know what it is you should do, then you can figure out how you do it, but your how is also framed by the why. And, and so that really sent me sort of on this journey to think, why do we exist? Right. What, what, right. Not only why do I exist, why do any of y'all exist, but why does fact exist? And, and that's what got me thinking more deeply about why are we doing what we're doing? And, and how should that frame what it is we do and how we do it? Why is always the most important. It really is. Yeah. It really is. And a lot of times we don't think about it. We just go through life, don't we? Just go through life. So thinking about the why yeah. Yeah. first provided the framework that's transformed your way of thinking sure. about legislation and lobbying. So what was this why and what brought it about? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've generally found that if you find a theology book that's four or 500 years old, it's probably worth reading because it's not been spun somehow. <laughs> and and I yeah. picked up a book. I usually read books to find out what's in the footnotes. And then I go read what's in the footnotes. And uh, I, I saw this book referenced multiple times by a guy named John Owen, who was considered perhaps the greatest theological mind that England ever produced. And it was in 1684. It was called... Um, the glory of Christ. It was actually called Discourses and Meditations on the Glory of Christ. And it was a 70 page uh, explication, I guess you could say, of this one verse from Jesus's prayer with his disciples where he said, Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which 
you have given me. And, and as I continued to read through that, he said this statement, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ is proposed as the principal object of our faith, love, delight, and admiration. In other words, Jesus is saying, I want you to be able to see my glory because when you get, are captured by, when you get a picture of, or a taste of my glory, that will be the thing that will so enthrall you that Paul would say, everything else I had, all my moralism, all my legalism, all my excelling, all of that is but dung compared mm. to knowing him. Yeah. And I began to think, what really is the glory of Christ? If somebody said to me, what is the glory of Christ? It'd be like, well, he saved me from my sin. Well, that's great. That's what he did. But what is the glory of Christ? And then I read this. If a man pretend himself greatly to desire what he never saw, he does but dote on his own imaginations. And the pretended desires of many to behold the glory of Christ in heaven. Oh, I want to see the glory of Christ in heaven. But who have no view of it by faith now while they're here in this world, are nothing but self-deceiving imaginations. And then I remembered what John had written in the first chapter of his book. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, those men had caught a picture, a sense even though still darkly, but an image of the glory of God in the face of Christ, and they had seen it. They had a taste for it. It wasn't his comeliness, was it? He said he, Isaiah said he had no comeliness, that we would desire him. It wasn't because he had mansions and power and all that. He was born in a stable in an obscure town and of an obscure tribe. They saw something in him that so captured them that they changed the world. And it was the glory of God that they'd gotten of a taste of that said, I want the full, real thing with no flesh in me anymore to obscure it. Mm. And I thought, can that be mm. said of me? Mm. Do many people want to be in the church because they've come face to face with the glory of God in the face of Christ or because they're simply trying to escape hell and really have no picture of the glory of Christ. But yet that's what Jesus said. That's what you need to see, my glory. Well, that was a shocker. Yeah. And then I read another sermon he published. It says, glory relates not only to the thing itself that's glorious. In other words, Jesus is glorious. He is man and yet God. And when we think of his office and what he did, that's, that's an, I mean, it, it could fill the mind forever. But he said glory is also the estimation or opinion we have of something. In other words, I will never make God more glorious. He is glorious. All I can do is show, manifest that he is glorious. And so I then read this prayer, and uh, boy, it sunk me to the ground. It's from a book of Puritan prayers called Valley of Vision. Some of you may have seen it. But he said this, O oh, Father, you've made man for the glory of yourself. Not that I'm going to make man so you can make me more glorious. You can't make God more glorious. What he's saying is you made me to experience and know the glory of the eternal mm. self-existing God who is love, who is pure moral. who You made me for that. Oh, wow. Mm. And, and you made me so that I could manifest and reflect that glory and right. manifest that glory to other people. And he says, and so when I'm not an instrument of that, I'm a thing of naught. I've missed my why. I've missed the reason for my existence. And I realized that not only did I need to better understand 
that in my own life, but that had to be the purpose of fact. Otherwise, it had missed its why. And uh, so, so that really comes to the question of the why that, yeah. that I've been talking about. So uh, as to the why, is there a way for you to sum that up for yeah, us? Yeah. What's the why? Uh, and, and, and here's a verse of scripture that to me encapsulates this. Uh, Paul wrote in, in Romans eleven thirty six, and it just really hit me a while back, this doxology at the end of Romans 11. He's been talking about the Jews and he's been talking about the Gentiles and then God's going to make the, right. the Jews jealous again. And, and he's just overcome with how God is, is in charge of the history of the world, moving it towards his end and purposes. And he breaks out with this doxology at the end of 36 and it concludes, from him and through him and to him are all things. He is glory. And therefore, it's natural to say, to him be glory. Mm. So, so I realize fact's purpose is not just to pass bills, pass good bills, kill bad bills. If that's all we're about, then I can lose my sense of why and I start doing all kinds of what's in order to say to people, look what I did. But you know, if I am able through this organization to manifest, reflect, show forth, speak to, call people's attention to the glory of God, then every bill can fail and I will have succeeded. That's right. You see the difference? Mm. So now when I, I look at legislation, I say, what, what things out there that I could work on are the things that I have the greatest opportunity to show forth the glory of God, to point people to God. Not what can I get passed so I can say, oh, look, I passed a bill. Aren't you happy? Send me money. Mm. <laughs> you see how that changes everything? Then you begin yeah. to say, well, I think I could pass this one and, and I can get some credit for that and everybody like me and they'll send me money. So, right. uh, so that's, that's how that changes things. And, and that changes then how you look at your what's. Right, right. Picture. Oh, yeah. my yeah. ear's falling off. Yeah, yeah. It's right there on your, on your shoulder. Okay. Well, um, so with that as the why, and as you just alluded to, we come to the what. Yeah, right. so, so David, tell us what is the what? Well, for us, it's, it's legislation and it's litigation. That's, that's the sphere in which we've been called to work. But here's the beautiful part of all that. Your goal is the same. Your why is the same. Maybe it's being a mother at home raising your children. It's for the glory of God. Maybe you're running a radio station. It's for the glory of God. This just happens to be where we've been called to work. And those are the things on which we work. But all of our goals should be the same. How do I manifest, reflect, show forth the glory of God? And so that's what we do. And, and so is there any specific focus in regard to those two what's? Sure, we, we've decided to, to, to avoid controversial things like the life of the unborn and abortion and human sexuality. <laughs> um, so, so why those two things? I mean, you're yeah. trying to get attention? Well, to, yeah, you, yeah. You, it's, it's a glutton for punishment <laughs> thing. No, no, really, um, you know, there are probably no two issues that are more socially mm -hmm. divisive yeah. than abortion, life, and human sexuality, marriage, same-sex marriage, and all of the sexual issues that are arising. But I also thought it's not surprising that coincidentally, and, I, and I, I should say providentially, those are the issues where most you have reason to talk about the why of the existence of life. Yeah. Why does marriage exist? Where does marriage exist? come from. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are lots of little things we could work on, lots of what's. But these two issues were the ones where I felt there was greatest platform in which to speak to things that would encourage the body of Christ to see the glory of God in marriage, see the glory of God in life, to call other people's attention to these why questions. So, so that's what we picked out. They represent the full majesty of the glory of God. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, 
Uh, there are three things we learn in the first chapter of Genesis. He created the earth. He created life. He created marriage. So there. It's simple. I didn't have to read the rest of the book. You mentioned something about, uh, about the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill. Uh, oh, you want to yeah, yeah. talk about that? Yeah, well, that, uh, that's it. You know, the Apostle Paul went into a pagan culture, and he spoke and said, Look, I see y'all got all kinds of gods. You even have one to the one you may have overlooked that you might be ticking off. But now I'm going to tell you the truth about the real God. And so just like Paul went into the arena, uh, we thought, well, that, that's what we can do. And, you know, it's interesting when you read Deuteronomy too. What, what does Moses say? He said, he's going to give you the land of a people that are mightier and stronger than you. Because when you take on the tough things, then it is easier to say, this is God alone. I'm not mighty enough. I'm not strong enough. I didn't go to a good enough law school. And you're probably thinking, yeah, but you're really handsome, and that probably counts for something. <laughs> but, you know, only my wife really thinks that. So, so I think the opportunities to glorify God in, in the biggest issues of our day is, is manifold. So, hey, let's go for it. You know, um, both of these issues, David, uh, they're bolstered in the cultural dominance by, by the U.S. Supreme Court decisions, which right. make passing legislation on these subjects so difficult. It has you litigating uphill, so to speak. <laughs> right. What would you say to those who think you should just move on and not spend time and resources on such issues? Yeah, yeah. you know... Um, I shared with our CEO today a verse that I think I'd shared before. I think it's Proverbs 21, 22, or 23. It says, the wise man goes after the city, scales the city, and takes down the stronghold in which they trust. There are a lot of people who say, well, that's dangerous. You can't win. Let's go after this over here. Let's go after this over here. Which if your goal is just to go after some things and pass some things, then that's great to do. But you know, when somebody trusts in something and you can take the thing they trust away from them, mm. ah, now you've put them in a place where they might look up and say, oh, and what will I now trust? You see? And so one of the things people trust in is the Supreme Court to put into effect policy that can't otherwise be enacted through representative government. And so that's, that's led to this notion of judicial supremacy. Yeah. And, and that's what gets thrown in my face all the time. Well, you can't do that because the court's already ruled on abortion. Well, there's no point in fighting on same-sex marriage because the court's already ruled on abortion. Let's move on. And to be honest, when it comes to marriage, every Christian organization in America, bar none, has moved on. Nobody is dealing with judicial supremacy arising out of the court's marriage decision. Yeah. You want to tell everybody what judicial supremacy is? Just expand on that. Yeah. I want to make sure everybody, yeah. it's, people, we throw that out a lot, but what does it mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, judicial supremacy is a notion that, that really didn't exist until uh, the late 1950s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there were some bubblings up of it, but, but it's the notion that the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of the Constitution and its opinions equate to or become the equivalent of the Constitution. And so they become the supreme law of the land. So that's what I see <coughs> on abortion all the time is, well, the Supreme Court's rule, that's the supreme law of the land. Or the Supreme Court's rule on, on marriage, that's the supreme law of the land. Well, uh, you know, the reality is, this mm -hmm. right here. Wow. Judicial supremacy is a lie. If you go away with nothing else from tonight, remember this little sentence. Mm -hmm. It's six words, five words. Judicial supremacy is a lie. Now that will be a shock to many lawyers. It was a shock to me because you see, I went through a law school that had an interest in making sure I thought the Supreme Court was supreme. And, and, and people need to understand what the supremacy clause that people throw in our face really says. And so here's what it is. It's Article 6 of the Constitution. And it says, This Constitution, the laws of the United States, which shall be made pursuant thereof. So what Congress 
passes, if they ever get past their dysfunction to pass something. And all treaties, which the United States made, those are the supreme law of the United States. Now we could take the rest of our time here together for you to read through that over and over and over and look for the word judicial opinions, Supreme Court opinions, but you won't find it, so just take my word for it. It doesn't exist. But that's what we do. We treat Supreme Court opinions as if they are the Constitution. So I, I began to do some research on this. Mm -hmm. Well, this was fascinating. Here's from New York University Law School. Woo, that's better than the University of Cincinnati, right? I, I didn't know this. It was not until 1834 that the court provided for the filing of its own written opinions with its own clerks. Now, if opinions were the Constitution of the United States, you'd think they'd make sure they got filed with their clerk, wouldn't you? Mm. Because otherwise, we're leaving the Constitution behind in somebody's office. And the oral opinions were not inevitably even reduced to writing. I told the president, leave me alone. I don't know what's going on here. Hold on a minute. Silent mode it's is University owned. University of Cincinnati Education. I tell you what, yeah, <laughs> the word on and off is a big word for me. So, so right there, that tells you that something's amiss with what our founders would have understood about the importance of opinions, right? They're so important, we didn't even file them. And some of the oral ones, we didn't even write down. Abraham Lincoln said this in the context of the Dred Scott decision and where the United States Supreme Court in the late 1850s uh, held that um, ancestors of slaves could never be uh, citizens because they were inferior beings. That's what the court said. So it, it didn't matter how far you had advanced since your ancestor was a slave. You, you just started from a bad stock. You could never become a real being. I mean, isn't that a terrible thought? Mm. But isn't that really what we do with abortion, right? It's the same thing. Mm. If we could just see it. So, so uh, anyway, he said this about the decision. He said, if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, now notice there the word whole people. What he's referring to is the Supreme Court issues a judgment. That judgment resolves a lawsuit between particular parties. It doesn't speak to the people who weren't the parties. Yeah. And he said, if that happens, then we will have resigned, uh, I, I, I went too far, their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. In other words, if you let the Supreme Court issue an opinion in a particular dispute and then extrapolate that to say, well, it applies to this and this and this and everybody, well, you've just resigned your government into the hands of nine unelected people on the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we've done. And so when I go to the Capitol and I say, hey, are you going to fight the abortion issue? Well, the Supreme Court's ruled. All we're going to do is lose. Well, some things are worth fighting for even if you lose, right? Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't right. exist as a country if that weren't true, but we've lost that spirit, except for a few people who I'll recognize in just a moment. Now, what does this mean? I love this quote from Justice Scalia. Mm. I'm going to write a commentary maybe next week called Scalia's Lord's Prayer for the Governor, the Legislature, and our Attorney General. But he's talking here about the Supreme Court's decision in 2013 that said Congress cannot enact the Defense of Marriage Act. They can't even define the words in their own statute. Now, how do you like that? I'm going to write a law, but I can't define what marriage is in my law I enacted. They said you need to defer to the states. Of course, two years later, they said uh, now the states have to defer to the Supreme Court. Yeah. But in any event, I love what he says. That, that opinion, when you read it, it, it's sort of like a person trying to admit how old they are when they're, you know, they just sort of come over their mouth and they don't want to really say exactly how old they are or, or whatever it might be. And, and so you read that opinion, it's like, well, what was it? Was it federalism? Was it states' right? What, what, what was this thing? Mm -hmm. and, and Scalia said in his dissent, Lord, an opinion with such scattershot rationales as this one, talk about federalism noises among them, can be distinguished in many ways and deserves to be. States and lower federal courts should take the court at its word and distinguish away. <coughs> in other words, we resolve the dispute between particular parties on a particular law, but don't assume that that now applies to a different law that's similar or to different parties. Distinguish it. Come back with something better than that. Give me a chance to fix it. 
And instead, we lay down. Yeah. So David, give, so given this and everything you said, how could Supreme Court opinions be equal to the Constitution? I mean, why would we now think that opinions are equal to the Constitution? Well, when you, when you read some of the stuff I just gave you, and I could give you lots more, you, you would say, why, why do we believe this? If that's the history, if that's true, if that's even what Scalia is saying is, is 2013. Mm. Well, the reason is because the Supreme Court is the final authority on what the Constitution means as to the parties who are involved in the lawsuit. And so in that sense, it is final, it is binding. And that's what Lincoln said, I'll enforce the law as to Mr. Scott, and Mr. Sanford. But we took that out of context in 1958 over the separation of segregation and all that. And we said, well, that's, that's just the law for everybody. And so that was, that was taken out of a context and then it got used. And, and I don't know if we'd talked about doing this, but I'm looking at my clock here for just a minute, but here's why it gets used today. It gets used by politicians, as I said earlier, either to get a policy for the whole people they can't get through the legislature, or in the case of Tennessee, to avoid addressing a controversial issue by saying, I wish I could do something. But you know, the Supreme Court rule, and that's it. I wish I could fix marriage. I wish I could, I could fix the abortion thing. You see, so politicians on both sides love to use the supremacy clause. It gets liberal policies done, and it protects weak-kneed conservatives from having to do anything. Mm-hmm. So yeah. anyway, that's free. I don't know if we plan to cover that. but <laughs> So why would state officials not try to draw distinctions between the abortion laws that were at issue in Roe and Casey and the marriage laws that were at issue in Obergefell. Well, they could if they're willing to. And that's what I want us to now talk about some of the the legislative stuff and and what they need to do when it comes to abortion and marriage is do exactly what Scalia said, distinguish away. So, well, I know what you said in that instance, but what about this? You see, one of the things that really disturbed me last year about the state Senate is they were afraid of maybe spending a million or $2 million to defend an, a, a pro-life law on abortion when they've got almost a billion dollar surplus. Yep. I mean, talk about straining at the gnat to say, is not the possibility of reversing Roe versus Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood and saving the lives of all innocent unborn children, is that not worth $2 million out of your savings account? Mercy. You see? Well, judicial supremacy, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court's rules, they're not going to reverse themselves. So you have to distinguish away. And we have a couple of bills this year that are going to deal with that. So, uh, so take an abortion. We'll start there. I mean, how do you deal with those decisions when it comes to passing pro-life legislation? especially yep. after the state Senate wouldn't pass a heartbeat bill because it was convinced that the Supreme Court wouldn't reverse Roe v. Wade or Casey versus Planned Parenthood. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, you can't ignore the decision like it just doesn't exist. Uh, so you have to find a way to distinguish it. So there are two bills that are going to be up there this year. One is called the Rule of Life Law, uh, Rule of Law Life Act. It's been filed by Senator Bowling and uh, Representative Dan Howell out of uh, Cleveland. And just to give you a little background on that bill, when the state house passed the heartbeat bill last year, the Senate uh, did not pass it, and they decided to have a study committee over the summer. Right. The pro-life community was great. They showed up in droves. Uh, Randy Davis with Tennessee Baptist Convention weighed in, got uh, tens of thousands of petitions signed, came down and testified in the summer. And and out of that, the legislators realized that, now get this, every pro-life organization, legal organization, Alliance Defending Freedom, Americans United for Life, National Right to Life, Tennessee Right to Life, and our organization, all the nationals and us, they're opposed to a heartbeat bill. So they said, well, we shouldn't pass a heartbeat bill. Now, you may wonder why, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But they were convinced that a heartbeat bill would not do the trick, and I had proposed a different way to go about it. And they said, at the end of the two days of hearing, Senator Fowler, would you 
Would you take the bill that you've drafted, strengthen it as much as you can, and bring it back to us? And so I did. And that's the bill. Now we're th I'm, that's I'm, the rule of law. That's life the rule act. of law. Life act. Now you want, you want to talk you, about that and the governor? Uh, yeah. And so the the governor, as you know, uh, came forward with the proposal at the start of the legislative session, and uh, it's undrafted, so we don't know what it says. He he gave us some bullet points about things that it would cover, but we haven't seen it. And as all lawyers and legislators will tell you, the devil's always in the details. Now I, I want to say, as we talk about these, that that it is it is a wonderful blessing to have a governor that would actually propose something pro-life. Yep. I mean, it is. Yeah. I've been in state politics for 20 something years and uh, Tom Leatherwood, who's here and in the house now, he was in the Senate before me. And I'm sure in the two years you were there, there was never pro-life legislation that came from a governor. So even the Republican governors we have didn't propose. So, yeah. so I'm grateful, yeah. but, but you have to go about doing it, it right if if you're going to succeed so I, I don't want to be critical of the governor's proposal but i do think people need to understand how this system works a little bit can you speak to those two proposals and how they differ i also wonder i didn't even ask you this earlier but if he hasn't even drafted his proposal yet if you haven't seen it how does it already have sponsors uh, you don't have to address that if you don't want to but i'm seeing um senator johnson and representative yeah. lamberth up there that's just it's well, wait, weird to you, me. You have to file a bill or there's a deadline. Right. So okay. you have to get it filed. And and he did say, here's what we want to do. I don't know exactly what it'll look like, but it will say, we're going to ban abortions or make it criminal for a doctor to do an abortion after, I think, a heartbeat is what he wants to do. But if the court does not uphold that law, then we'll make it 14 or 16 weeks. And if the court doesn't uphold that law, then we'll make it 18 or 20 weeks, okay? That's what Missouri did. Now, again, I don't know the governor's proposal, but I read the Missouri bill today to see how it was worded. And God bless them in Missouri, but somebody needed to show me, <laughs> as they would say, how, how to do something better than what they did. Here's what they said. Life begins at conception. A human being begins at conception. Yay, yay, yay. But here's the thing. The Supreme Court has said that you can't interfere with a woman's liberty to have an abortion or create an undue burden on a woman's right to have an abortion until the baby's viable, could survive outside the womb. Okay, that's what the Supreme Court said. So what they did is rather than say, this is a human being and we're gonna protect human beings from being murdered, I don't care you know, how far into it it is, once life is given to you by God, it's given to you by God. Supreme mm -hmm. Court doesn't get to decide when you become a person or a life. And so, but here's what they did. They said, so because a large percentage of abortions aren't done until after eight weeks, now they used eight weeks, that's not an undue burden on a woman because most women are having the abortions before then. And I kind of look and I want to say, oh, so in other words, because it won't stop many abortions or as many abortions, well, we're okay with that. You, you see the point? Now, if you're a pragmatist, you would say, that's great. Save as many lives as we can. But pragmatism is its own worldview and it does not glorify God. Pragmatism says, what can I do? What will work? God glorifying things say life is the gift of the creator and no man can take it from another without due process of law. I'm happy to say that. I've said that to the governor. I cannot be for a bill that says the Supreme Court gets to decide when you become a life that's worth protecting. You see, and, and here's the problem. Let, let, me, let me talk about distinguishing away. Here's how you distinguish away. See, what, what's happening is the Supreme Court said you can't put an undue burden on a woman's right to abort prior to the, uh, 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 viability. So viability is an arbitrary subjective standard, right? If you happen to live closer to Le Bonheur, than uh, in, in Obion County, your odds of surviving as a premature baby are better, right? 
So your constitutional odds depend on how close you live to Le Bonner or how close you live to Vanderbilt. Well, that's crazy. Your constitutional rights shouldn't depend on how close you are to a child hospital, right? So that's subjective. Well, what they're doing is they're saying, well, the only objective point for you to be a life that's worth protecting is either at conception or once you escape the birth canal. Those are objective points, right? Anything in between there is, is subjective. Now, the Supreme Court has said over and over and over, if you want me to reverse a precedent that's 47 years old, then you have to give me a compelling, principled reason for doing it. Because I don't want to look like I'm arbitrary and we're changing 47 years worth of precedent, precedent because we got Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. That's not a constitutionally principled reason for reversing a decision. So when you go into court and you accept that the court gets to decide when you're a human being and the court gets to pick an arbitrary point and you say, I like my arbitrary point better than your arbitrary point, what principled reason have you given them, particularly when you're saying, how about this arbitrary point? But if you don't like that one, how about this arbitrary point? But if you don't like that one, how about this arbitrary point? What's my principled reason? Okay, well, earlier it's because life looks like life exists when there's a heartbeat even though we know it exists before there's a heartbeat, but that's what we're going to focus on. Oh, well, at, at 14 weeks, there's more circulatory system and more organs. So that, that now should be the standard. You see what they're doing? They're, they're, yeah. they're playing within the margins of arbitrary subjective standards and letting the Supreme Court decide what the standard is for when you become a human being. So if we don't reverse Roe, even if the court were to say, okay, you get to be a person at 18 weeks or 16 weeks or 14 weeks or eight weeks or maybe even a heartbeat. The principle remains in the law that the Supreme Court decides when you get to be a person and when you become a life worthy of protecting. So at some point you have to lay the ax at the root, you see. Now, as a practical matter, people would say, David, and I was asked this, aren't you for a heartbeat bill that would stop the bulk of abortions? And I said, if I'm a pragmatist, yes but I've concerned with the, the poisonous root that says the Supreme Court is God and they get to decide questions and I go to them and beg for something, then no, I'm not for that principle remaining in the law because that's not their job. It's in Him we live and move and have our being, mm -hmm. not in the power of the Supreme Court. So, yeah, yeah. so that's my testimony to the truth. Yeah. So, so there's where we, we are. We're probably running out of time. But Would so, you, what you have to do is create a distinction. Yeah. Is there any way we have got about a minute left in this segment? Is okay. there any way? Can yeah. You, yeah. Can you, can so, you highlight so like the rule me, of law, uh, the rule of law of life yeah. act. So you have to create a distinction. You have to give them a principled reason, right? One arbitrary thing over another arbitrary thing sounds kind of arbitrary. So here's what we're trying to do with the rule of law life act. In the Fourteenth Amendment, it says you can't deprive people of life or liberty or property without due process of law. No person. So. There's, there's two words in there. We won't look at all of them, but one of them is liberty, right? The other word that's over there is the word life. Yeah. The Supreme Court said in Roe, well, we don't really know what a life is. We don't know when it begins, blah, 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 blah. And, and so we're just going to look at the word liberty. So the Supreme Court said in 1992, the controlling word in all this discussion about abortion is the liberty of the woman. Okay? Well, what if I could create a conflict between the word life and liberty? What if I could define the word life so that it included the unborn child? Now I would have a conflict between the life of the unborn child and the liberty of the mother. And that's never been raised before. And now I've got something the Supreme Court has to deal with that's principled, you see. Well, how might we go about doing it? Well, the Ninth Amendment, and this is what I love, and this is why this is so wonderful. Even if we lose, lose, lose for the next 20 years, not that I want to, but the Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights. In other words, our founders believed, and we have forgotten, that our rights do not come from the enumeration of statutes and constitutions, but they exist before government because they come from God. That's right. And so that's in our Constitution. Yeah. Why not use it? It's like Josiah finding out, oh, we got the law back here. I wonder if we should read it. Oh, I get poo-pooed. Well, nobody's ever tried that before. 
Well, it doesn't change that it's in the Constitution. We all know what it means. And actually, the, the Supreme Court said over and over and over, the Constitution has to be understood in terms of the common law because the common law, which is that pre-existing notion of law, it was the lexicon by which we even got the words life, liberty, and property. The words life, liberty, and property come from William Blackstone's commentaries on the law of England. So when you look at the common law, look what it defines life as. An infant in the mother's womb is supposed in the law to be born for many purposes. Children can inherit. You've all drafted wills that refer to descendants and issues, and you can injure a child that's in the womb and have damages. The only place that the law does not give the unborn legal recognition is with abortion. Mm. So what do I do? I then say, well, well, now we know what the word life means because you didn't look at it from that angle. And now what have I done? I've created that conflict. Now, what you have to understand, and one of the things I was saying and fussing about with what I'm hearing, is that if you go back to the Supreme Court and you assume that Roe and Casey are the, are the applicable precedent and the Supreme Court's in charge, they will never reverse themselves. I gave an example this morning. My wife and I dated for a long time. Finally, we broke up when I realized, you know, we need to get married or stop dating. But, but you know, if, if all she had ever asked me is, do you love me? I could have said, yeah, yeah, having a great time. Love you, Valerie. You know, do you love me? Yeah, I love you, love you, love you. Finally, it's like, are we going to get married or what? Whoa, that was a different question, wasn't yeah. it? So when you go back to the Supreme Court and, and, you, and you don't even ask them to say, I think you got it wrong, there's a conflict, they will not reverse themselves. Right. Why? Because you didn't ask. So you have to phrase the question in such a way that it's so narrow that even David can't miss the fact that Linda wants to know, is this relationship going towards marriage or are we just having a good time? Mm. Yeah. So, so you don't just throw all the crap on the wall and see if something sticks. You say, here is the rifle shot. I'm giving you one specific question. And if you want to hear the question, you have to answer my question. What does life mean? Does life extend to the child in the mother's womb? I have law on my side, constitutional law on my side. That creates a conflict with liberty. Mm -hmm. Now you have to decide something. Yeah. You see the difference? Yeah. That's how you distinguish away. So we'll see what happens. I'm hopeful. We're talking with the governor. Uh, we'll see what he does. But that's, that's sort of the topic. So we need to move on yeah, here. Let's do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But I, wanted, I thought that was so important to address that. You know, but, yeah. So what about marriage? Let's talk about that. Yeah, marriage is a good thing. Uh, we have filed this year uh, a marital contract at Common Law Recording Act. It was filed in the Senate by Janice Bowling, uh, who was carrying the Life Act, and your own, uh, rep I started to say Senator Tom Leatherwood, that's what he was for me, but um, uh, Tom Leatherwood, uh, who's here tonight. And if y'all would, thank, thank Tom for being willing to carry. Uh, and, and, and here's the thing. Tom and I are friends. We've worked together. I've seen him in the battle. I mean, if you can get through the income tax wars, everything else is pretty calm after that. But uh, I, I actually explained the bill to Tom, and he still decided to carry it. Isn't that good? So it wasn't like, David, I trust you. What did you get me into? Tom said, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And, he, and, and, you know, I think he's the perfect person because here's what this bill does. It distinguishes the old Bergefell case. And, and it says, the Supreme Court did not decide everything. They left us a door, and we're going to go through the door. And as you'll see in just a moment, Tom is familiar with the door. Now, I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But here's really the question. <clears throat> this, this is it. Is marriage an institution that was created and given to us by government, or is it God-given? If it's God-given, then we're not free to change it. We can't make straight what the Lord made crooked. We can't remove the spots of the, of the leopard. Now, if, if we created marriage, then we can make it whatever we want. Okay? But we believe God created marriage. And the Supreme Court, though, did not address that question. And so, if you'll go to this website, godgivenmarriage.com, you will read everything you need to know about this bill, You'll find the legal stuff. You'll find the theological stuff. You'll find the constitutional stuff. You'll sign, find some videos about how the Supreme Court decision is being used that will shock you. But here's, what, here's what's going to be in the bill. 
this is this is fascinating. I found about three two months ago a letter signed by 60 constitutional law scholars that was all saying exactly what I've been telling you about judicial supremacy. I found out I wasn't alone. I mean, there are guys from like Princeton and all these places that, that agree with me, even though I went to the University of Cincinnati. So that was good. <clears throat> but what was cool is over time, in continuing to plug on this, as I went through those lists of 60, four of them have been advising and consulting with me and are on record to come testify in support of this bill. So here's one of the things the bill will say. Now, this is written by my constitutional law professors. The Supreme Court, in its Obergefell decision, did not and did not attempt to eradicate, alter, or modify this antecedent or pre-legal and thus natural institution as marriage. In other words, marriage existed before the state of Tennessee ever thought about coming into existence, ever thought about passing a statute. Marriage existed. People got married. And he said the Supreme Court did not address that. They didn't even try to address it. Instead, the court required only that marriage as a creature of the positive law, enacted law, be made available to opposite sex couples on equal terms. So if you think you create marriage, you need to create it the way the Supreme Court thinks it's created. And they went ahead in this bill, you'll see it. The common law or natural institution of marriage was expressly left untouched by the court. In other words, they didn't say common law marriage, the, the marriage that people entered into before there were government permission slips, they didn't say that doesn't exist. They said, we're not even talking about that. Well, there's my opening. There's the door. You didn't rule on that. I can distinguish that. You talked about this. I'm talking about this. The natural kind of marriage that people have been entering into since Adam met Eve. and went, woo, okay. So... It was expressly left untouched by the court. This is also going to be in the bill. The provisions of the Ninth Amendment mean that the right to marry in the Fourteenth Amendment shall not be construed to deny or disparage the right of a man and a woman to enter into a marital contract at common law. You see, because there's a pre-governmental antecedent before you ever thought of having a license, understanding that marriage exists. And so the Fourteenth Amendment cannot be construed to deny those other rights that we hold that come from God. Do you see why I want to talk about this? Yeah. We get to talk about, do rights come from the government or do they come from God? And who is this God? And are we free to change what God has, has said things are? See the wonderful opportunity to bear witness, point to the glory of God, make people think about God a little bit? I think it's great. So here's what we're going to do. We'll repeal the license law, allow a man and a woman to get married, go find Steve Gaines, Fritz Sevilla, <coughs> excuse me, Gary, say, we want to get married, exchange all your vows, make all your promises, you know, whatever you need to do. And then you go down to the courthouse and you record the fact that you got married. Because see, the government didn't create your marriage. You created your marriage before the eyes of God in the presence of the pastor and witnesses. You made vows and covenants and promises, and you go tell everybody we did that. And you know what? That's exactly like deeds. If you've ever bought or sold a home, you didn't say, I need to go down and get my house buyer's license, or I need to go get my house seller license. You put a sign in the yard, you ran an ad in a commercial appeal. Somebody saw your house, drove by, said, I'll throw money at you. And you said, great, here's a deed. You just bought a house without the government's permission. <laughs> Isn't that something? There's still one thing you can do without the government's permission. But what do you do? You go record it at the Register of Deeds office so that everybody knows you down on the house. So the guy who sold it to you doesn't sell it to somebody else that afternoon. So that when you want to sell it 30 years from now, everybody knows that you own the house and it's not the old, oh yeah, you live in the old Payne house. No, I live in the Valor house. And guess who happened to be the Register of Deeds in Shelby County? Who's lived with this system for, what was it, eight years at the time? 12, 100 years? Wow, you were really old. I didn't remember I was so young. <laughs> so see, Tom understands that system. This is not anything funny or strange to him. I didn't have to explain how deeds work. I'm like, oh, I get that. And marriage is worth defending. Creating extinction is worth creating. Those are the kind of people we need. Yeah. And, and, you know, I talked to several lawyers. They were not willing to carry the bill. And I thought, well, wait a minute. God gave me a register of deeds. 
Yes. Like Shakespeare, kill all the lawyers. Anyway, <laughs> let's go on. There's a few other bills. Yeah, um, let's, let's touch on uh, the Business Protection Act. Talk yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah, this is another bill dealing with the human sexuality issue. We passed a bill several years ago that said cities could not impose upon businesses new protected classes of citizens. Our civil rights laws apply to religion, race, <laughs> sex, you know, male or female, ethnicity, you know, the basic things of the civil rights law. But what we saw happening around the country was cities were in particular going and saying, yeah, but you have to include sexual orientation or you have to include gender identity and cross-dressing and all that. And if you don't, you can't do any business with the city. <coughs> well, we passed a law that said you can't impose that mandate on a business. Well, that was good. But then some cities started saying, well, you don't have to do that. But when you want to bid on a city job or when you want to use the city's facility, we're going to rate the businesses to decide which ones will let use it. And if you go beyond what the law requires, then you get extra points. And if you don't, you may get minus points. So see, it's not an imposition, it's not a mandate. It's just a sneaky way to get around the law. So we got it passed through the house last year with Jason Zachary. And uh, they said, no, you can't make that a preference. You can't make that a discriminating factor. And uh, the Senate, the Senate uh, messed with the bill last year and it's in a committee and I don't know that we'll be able to get it out. And, uh, and I will just tell you, Paul Rose, he's new. Uh, he did a great job working on the, the adoption, you know, Christian adoption agencies and stuff. But now he's got big business, AT&T and all those people pounding on him saying, we don't need it, we don't need it. And of course they don't need it. Why? Because they get the preference, right? Yeah. It's all about money. But any of y'all who know him, encourage him. Stay the fight. Stay the fight. Move the bill. Let's get it through the Senate. Make them vote, if nothing else, so that we know who's with us and who's not. They need to be on record. Yeah, they need to be on record. That's right. And uh, so anyway, that's that's Maybe, one of those bills. And then there's another yeah, one. Yeah, the other one, of uh, the, the School Protection Act. Let's talk about that. Yeah, one of the things that you've seen going on is uh, around the country is that a uh, uh, Bob wakes up one morning and he decides, you know, I really have been a girl all these years. And so he wants to be Bobette and, you know, wants to run on the girls track team, use the girls locker room, whatever it might be. And, and the problem is we got schools that are certainly willing to, to do that. But we also have schools, particularly in more conventional rural areas, conservative areas, who will say, no, 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 I'm not going to let Bobette, you know, go in here and take a shower with the other girls or whatever it might be but they can't afford to be sued by the ACLU. So it's easy to capitulate because I'd have to take this all the way to the Supreme Court and that's a million dollars in Tipton County or Hardin County or Fayette County or O'Brien County, they can't afford that. So just, sorry. So this bill would say, look, if the ACLU wants to pick on one of our school systems, they need to know they're picking on the state of Tennessee and the Attorney General can step in and defend the local school system that, that says no, Biological males go here, biological females go here, and if you're not sure what you are or you want to transfer, then you can go to this other place. You, you can have a different shower, you can have a different bathroom, a different changing facility. You see, they don't want different. So we need to protect those schools. Now again, we passed that through the House quite easily, and we're really struggling in the Senate. Uh, I'll confess, I'm not sure we'll be able to pass the bill in the Senate. Uh, there are a lot of people who are concerned that if we pass these bills, you may have already seen it, you know, AT&T and Amazon and all these big companies write these letters and say, you're going to harm the economy. You know, we're going to have to boycott you. And it's kind of like, you know, you move here because you like who Tennessee is and then you don't want us to be Tennessee anymore. Yeah. So take our tax breaks and just enjoy being in Tennessee. We don't do those kinds of things. But let me say this, and this, this will sound harsh, and gosh, I don't mean to sound harsh. But see, at some point, as a Christian legislator, you have to decide if blessing and honor and power 
and glory come from God or from other people? And then you have to decide whether or not if you lost some stuff, is doing is recognizing the distinction between men and women worth doing. Hmm. And that really gets down to the why do I exist as a state legislator? You got to answer the why question. Why am I here? What will I bear witness to and let God appeal to the conscience of men? 2 Corinthians 4, 6. We bear witness to the truth for the conscience of every man. And see, that's also changed my view of why. My job is not to batter and beat you up. I used to try to do that. I, I, will, I will do like everybody else does. And I will beat you up. I will target you. I will do this. I will do that, you know. And, and boy, I, I could. And I can have a very sharp tongue. I, I can make grown men and women cry. I can also make them curse the day I was born. But, hmm. but you see, what I need to do is bear witness to the truth and say to the Christian, why are you here? What is the truth? Are you just going to do the truth or not? And let God deal with them. You see, he's able to remove them from office anytime he wants. By any right. means he chooses. That doesn't mean I don't inform voters. It doesn't mean I don't tell you to encourage Paul Rose to stick to his guns and push the bill. But, but you know, I don't, I don't have to get up here and be nasty about anybody. And I've done that too often. Because you see, I forgot my why when it came to the how. You see, if you keep the why right, you'll get the what and the how right. And that's what I'm learning. And that's why I felt it was so important to talk about that today, because it's so easy to be angry at our politicians. And if we believe that God is sovereign and in his providence, he establishes nations and rulers and kings, then we're really grumbling against God. And I've done a lot of grumbling because he let the wrong people be in office. And maybe he's saying, no, you let them be in office. Because you lost track of the why and the what. So anyway, wow. uh, there are a lot That's of other tough. bills up there. There are thousands of them. I will tell you, lots of bills dealing with medical cannabis. Lots of bills reducing the crimes for, um, for marijuana possession. There are bills dealing with... Uh, kids, transgendered kids that are wanting to race, you know, in the girls' races and boys that want to race in the girls' races now and all that sort of stuff. There are those bills up there. We'll be tracking those bills too. Um, so on, on this bill tracking thing, and for those on the web, you'll see that we have a lot more bills listed. But the reason that I wanted to begin where I did and not just make this a recitation of bills is because all we do is recite bills and tell you what they do, then I'm not sure we fulfilled our why. And I want you to leave tonight with better understanding your own why and our why and saying, just keep, keep doing the right thing. Let God deal with that. Pray for us. Pray for us. So anyway, thanks for letting me cover some non-political stuff at the beginning and uh, we're happy to answer some questions i think we yeah, have some time I'm waiting. yes here we go yeah great thank you gary all right so we got what two here is that right gary two questions okay yeah if you have if you have some more yeah just raise your hand gary will come by and grab a card um so why can the school Protection Act not require one attorney general to defund, to defend the schools. So why, why can the School Protection Act not require the attorney general to oh. defend schools? Well, the, the attorney general is his own constitutional officer. So one branch of government can't tell the other what to do. Now, we can pass a law 
and the executive is supposed to carry it out, but the attorney general can't be required to defend certain lawsuits. That's part of his discretion within his constitutional authority. We can authorize him to do it. And that's what the bill would do. And then it would say that if he declines to do it or feels that there might be a conflict of interest between the state's interest and the local school, then the state would reimburse the school for going out and getting its own attorney. But, but that's why we can't require it. We authorize him to do it, but we can't require it. It's a separation of power issue. Great. Next question. What is the best way to lobby state legislators or any good ways should we lobby committee members? Well, um, one, lobby God first. <laughs> I mean, that sounds sort of trite, but um, I've, 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 my, what I've been going through, Todd, has yeah. changed my prayer life. Right. Because if God doesn't do things, all my labors are of no avail. You know, there's a great hymn like that, uh, where all the labors of my hands could not, you know, fulfill the law's demands. So I need to be praying. I need to be praying not just let them vote for this bill, but God, give them a sense if they're professing believers of their why and why they're here. Give them a sense of your awesomeness. Give them a sense of a holy fear. Speak through when David speaks so that they don't just hear this man, they hear God speaking to them. When they read their Bible, would you pull words off the page and through the Holy Spirit speak to them that they know what is righteous and just because your kingdom and your throne is founded on righteousness and justice, and theirs surely cannot. If their thrones are derivative of God's throne and God's founded on justice and righteousness as the Bible founds it, then they have no authority to be unjust and unrighteous. Then you need to develop relationships with them as best you can. Get on their email list. Almost all legislators now have email lists and they send you their stuff every week. Uh, and, and, and read through what it is they're doing. Ask them questions, particularly if you're from their district. Now, if you're not from their district, uh, you know, if you email Janice Bowling, she may not respond to you. Uh, but but um, email your legislator. Say, where are you on, on this bill? Now, don't do what somebody did to me. Every year, he would send me a list of every gun bill that had been filed and want to know what I thought about it. And I'm grateful that he loved the Second Amendment. <laughs> but I knew half of those bills would never even be looked at. <laughs> And it's kind of like, I don't want to figure out where I stand on a bill that I know is not going to be heard. So make sure it's a bill. If, you know, if it's on our tracking thing that we're monitoring, then we're thinking there's some prospect that this might move. So say, I, I, want, I would like to know where you stand on those. But try to do it one at a time for Tom Leatherwood's sake. You know, don't just send him 30 bills. Find the ones that you're most interested in and then try to try to do that with Deb. You know, be Deb. polite. Yeah. Be Christ -like. Be polite. That's yeah. right. Don't forget the, the why of how you're That's doing right. it. Uh, and, and you know, if it's your legislator, insist on an answer at some point. Thank you, I sent this email two weeks ago. I, you know, at least have them acknowledge I got the email. Uh, that's okay. Uh, they have things slip through their cracks just like everybody, they're, they're overworked. So don't say, well, I sent an email last night and you haven't answered it. Just don't do that, Yeah. okay? Uh, so th they, th they, they, they want to hear from you. Yeah. I mean, they need to hear from you, but they, I think most of them want to hear from you, especially if you're a, one of their constituents. Yeah, that's right. They do. And those in this area really need to hear from you, from people in this room. And, and I will tell you sometimes phone calls because they get so many emails and now they come from around the world, you know, they just get spammed, you know, from people in a China that don't like some particular bill of a phone call saying I'm from the district. I wanted, my senator, I live here, uh, to know that I really strongly support such and such, and I'd hope he'd vote for it. If he wants, needs to know my reasons, let me know. Don't argue with the secretary. Sometimes they may not even like their legislator, but it's their job, okay? So, so you know, just be polite um, with, with the secretary. That'll get you a lot further than not, um, because the secretary person is the gatekeeper to the legislator. So, um, so, yeah. so that's that's good a good thing to do. When they have a town hall meeting, if you can go, go to the town hall meeting. You know, now try to remember not to embarrass them. The goal is not to embarrass. The goal is to get information. The goal is to encourage. You know, I used to remember there was a governor I served with one time. And we'd sit in the room and he'd grab his collar and he'd say, what kind of idiot would support a bill like that? Well, when all the idiots were in the room with him, it was kind of, you know, a little awkward. <laughs> so, 
So, so anyway, just be mindful of that. I won't say which governor that was, but. I think there's only a couple that we can think of. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, next question. How do we ensure that the common law marriage, one man and one woman, is the only one that can be recorded? Well, that's a great, <coughs> great question. There are a lot of legal issues around this that I don't have time to get into. But one of, one of the great problems that we have is this problem of judicial supremacy. You see, when, when the state of Tennessee was sued in connection with its marriage laws, they sued Governor Haslam. They were sued by four couples who had married from another state and moved here. They sued the governor to say, you need to recognize the legitimacy of the marriage we got in New Jersey or California or New York. They didn't sue any county clerks. They didn't sue because nobody denied them a license. Now in Ohio, they did sue about the license law. <coughs> okay, great. But they didn't sue Tennessee over it. What our attorney general did is he took the doctrine of judicial supremacy and he said, well, because Ohio's law is unconstitutional. Ours is already void. Without a court ever ruling that way, it's already void. I've got it from his office in a letter. I've got it from his office in a briefing file. It's void. But now here's judicial supremacy on steroids. If it's void, and it's been void since 2015, who has gotten a valid marriage license at all? because the Supreme Court cannot replace the statute that's made void. You see, they can say your law's void and you can't enforce it. Now they never said that about Tennessee's laws. We're just pretending as if they did, but he's pretending as if somebody changed the law and they've never changed the law. So we, we've got to get that addressed because technically, legally, if you really adhere to the constitution, the law is the law until a court enjoins it or the legislature repeals it, or in the case of the Constitution, the people repeal it. The law is the law. You just can't ignore it because the Attorney General thinks you ought to. He's not God. He's not the Supreme Court. He's not a judge. He's not the legislative body. So our Constitution still says you cannot have any policy, law, or judicial interpretation that purports to define marriage as anything other than a man and a woman. That's what the Tennessee Constitution says. And then it says, and any decision purporting to do that is void and unenforceable. That's why our ministers are signing. They're saying, you look like Governor Haslam. The definition of marriage has changed and I have to sign this form. And it looks as if Caesar now defines marriage contrary to what God's law says. And I can't sign that form, but I don't think you had any authority to change the form because your form is unconstitutional. Because no court's ever enjoined it. So we've got to fight through some legal issues. But my point right now and what I told Tom is until that provision in Tennessee's constitutional is it, we're told that it can't be enforced, he can't authorize two people of the same sex to record one. Plus the constitution says the historical institution and legal contract, solemnizing relationship between one man and one woman is the only marital contract in the state. So there is no historical institution of same-sex marriage. So see, we, if we're, now if we're just gonna disregard the constitution all the time, which seems to be the current prevalent mode, just ignore it, well then yeah, they can do anything they want to. Hmm. But, but if they're gonna obey the constitution, they can't do it. But you see, I've got to get past this judicial supremacy. As long as that's the prevailing mindset, and that's why that's got to be attacked. That's the stronghold in which people trust. And it's got to be attacked. If we don't, we're wasting our time. Yeah. Next question. I think they're referring probably to Virginia or maybe New York. How can they pass, how can certain states pass laws to murder babies up to their birth? Well, you know, I, I would argue that they couldn't and they shouldn't. Uh, and that's part of the question that would get addressed by the Rule of Law Life Act. But as long as the Supreme Court has, has said that a woman has liberty, the state can give her as much liberty as it wants. 
Now, one of the things that was true about common law, I would encourage you, go to our website, and under the legislative tab, you'll see heartbeat bill. Click on heartbeat bill and go watch the testimony of Adam McLeod. He's one of those 60 law professors that I mentioned. He talks about the common law. And it, you know, the more I watch it, just the more beautiful it is to me and what a powerful witness. He says, look, at the common law, we believe that we had certain inalienable rights that came, absolute rights, from outside government. They were reflected in the common law, they were consistent with natural law, and they were confirmed by revealed law. And one of the absolute laws was life. And the reason it was absolute, because life was given by the Creator. I mean, he says this right in the testimony. I mean, what a wonderful bearing of witness right there, right? Instead of arguing about when should we decide to let you have a life, he's saying, here's where it is. And it exists in the child. So what he said is that the object of government was intended to secure the rights we already had. You see? So what he would be saying is, New York or Virginia can fail in its duty. They should secure the rights that we have from God. That was the whole intent of this country, remember? But they can fail at it. I just don't want them to keep failing in Tennessee. Got two more here. Based on the 10th Amendment, are not the abortion issue and the marriage issue state responsibilities and not federal responsibilities? Yeah, you know, and the states have started using the 10th Amendment. They haven't used the 9th Amendment very much. Uh, but yes, marriage, abortion, health policy, those were all considered state functions because Congress only had delegated duties. You see? So if they gave them authority to develop post offices. Great, have post offices. Uh, states would say that's fine, you know. But we, we've, what's happened, what's happened to me that's so sad is states have abdicated the protection of people's God-given rights and even the rights of their own state. Mm. I had a national Christian legal organization that discouraged me from fighting over marriage and you know why? They said, well, David, at the end, is it not possible that even if marriage comes back to Tennessee, you could repeal the constitutional amendment and your legislature would still license same-sex marriages? And I said, well, yeah. If I got authority back over it at some point, yeah, they might do that. And he said, then what's the point? Now, this, if I told you the name of this organization, you'd be disgusted. And I said, here's the point. At least we would have chosen to do it in a constitutionally correct manner. Yeah. That's right. Not have the Supreme Court impose it on us. Yeah. That to me is worth fighting for. So whoever asked that question, you see, we're just abdicating. Our attorney general is just abdicating our sovereignty, everything. Mm. It's, you know, the next thing I'm going to try to get Tom to do is file a resolution to remove the attorney general, but I'll talk about it in another way. But <laughs> All right. Anyway. Oh, we're almost out of time. Right, last question here. How would no fault... Tom left with his hair on fire. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, he's ready. All right. Yeah. How would no fault divorce be affected by common law marriage? How would no fault divorce? No fault divorce be affected by common law marriage. Yeah. Well, that, that's, a, that's a really great question. What we're doing is we're we're, we're, we're biting off what we need to chew first. So we're saying, we're going to decide how you get married, and we're not going to worry about trying to fight the other battle at the same time of how do you get divorced. Just, just leave those alone. We can deal with that later. Okay? Uh, oftentimes, in legislation, the more stuff you put in, the more reason, well, I like that part, but I don't like that part. Well, I like that part, but I don't like that part. So let's just deal with this one part. Do we get to decide what a marriage is? And let's answer that. Then we'll answer what a divorce is next, if you want to do that. So we're leaving that alone. But now in, in the common law, because this was such a sacred institution, you just couldn't say, well, she got ugly and fat. And he didn't say, well, you've developed a gut, you know, and, and I'm leaving. 
So, you know, you had to have cause. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we need to re-examine that issue, but let's, let's deal with yeah. one, one problem at a time. Right. Yeah, one, one problem at a time. David, thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. I hope it was helpful.